I got interested in uh, patients with premorbid disability because these are patients that we encounter quite frequently in our in our practice. Uh, we, based on population studies, we think that probably about one in three or perhaps one in four patients with stroke out there in the real world have some degree of uh, premorbid disability, meaning that they're already needing some help with some of their daily activities before they have their stroke. Uh, but unfortunately, we've not done a good job of enrolling uh, these patients in uh, clinical trials or even really uh, uh, longitudinal studies of patients with stroke. So we don't have a good sense of uh, how they fare with and uh, without uh, reperfusion therapies like thrombolysis or thrombectomy. Uh, and so people are left in their practice with a lot of uncertainty about how to deal with these patients uh, and how to uh, evaluate uh, whether they're going to have a good response to these kinds of therapies. Um, and so we became interested in uh, rigorously trying to evaluate uh, what's happening out there in the real world right now to patients that are being treated with reperfusion therapies who also happen to have some premorbid disability. Fortunately, uh, there are several physicians uh, out there in the real world who are actually treating these patients and offering them these therapies. So it's um, uh, offered as the opportunity to look at the data and compare that to what we have for patients without such disabilities. So this was a really interesting collaboration that uh, emerged thanks to uh, the international connections we have at the Calgary Stroke Program. So the data we looked at uh, were actually from the Czech Republic. So the Czech Republic is part of uh, a, an international stroke treatment registry program called SIS. And uh, in recent years, they've also launched their own um, high quality uh, stroke treatment registry called Rescue. And so we looked at data from a combination of these registries uh, going back uh, uh, since, say, 2017 or so. And uh, we were looking to evaluate uh, outcomes really in patients with premorbid disability that were captured in that registry. And, um, you know, well, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, we had a fairly good representation of these patients um, in the registry uh, that uh, allowed us to do some meaningful analyses um, in these patients. Uh, so to give you a specific number, we had uh, 1,712 patients who had uh, pre-stroke disability, which we defined as a pre-stroke modified Rankin scale score of three or more. So that's fairly moderate the stroke disability, pre-stroke disability at least. And uh, we compared that to some 20,000 odd patients uh, who didn't have pre-stroke disability. And uh, what we found was that uh, in even in this sort of registry setting, which, which already comprises of patients who are receiving some sort of stroke treatment, so thrombolysis at least, or if not that, then thrombectomy, it was interesting to see that the patients who had pre-stroke disability were very less likely to receive EVT. Um, so about 10% of those with pre-morbid disability were getting EVT as opposed to say 21% of those without. And even when they were treated, they had slower uh, treatment times. Um, so it's a, this this suggests that there, there are differences in uh, access to care that are happening for these patients, potentially related to the fact uh, that I mentioned earlier that uh, we don't have uh, high quality uh, clinical trials based evidence to, to offer thrombectomy and other such therapies to these patients. Um, but what was interesting is that while unsurprisingly, we found that uh, patients with pre-stroke disability did worse than those without any disability because you know by 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 definition they're they're sort of coming in with a with a higher degree of pre-existing disability what was what was interesting to us is that we were able to show that uh, nearly a third of those patients with pre-stroke disability actually were able to return to uh, their 
uh, pre-stroke state, meaning uh, they didn't end up with additional incremental disability after their stroke and after they were treated. And if we think about that, that's really sort of the best possible outcome we could achieve for a patient with pre-morbid disability. We can't get them better than they were before their stroke. We can only get them to the way that they were before. That's the best possible outcome. And so it was interesting to see that we, we uh, that the, the uh, Czech team was able to get there in uh, nearly a third of their patients. Uh, there were obviously you know, variations in, in, in their ability to achieve that based on patient age, right? If you looked at the young patients, those under 65 years of age, it was nearly two thirds, 66% of patients that returned to their pre-stroke state. If you got to the kind of oldest group that we looked at, those over 85, then it, then the number came down to about 20%, but still about one in five patients. And uh, what was most interesting to us is that when we did uh, this analysis approach uh, uh, called uh, propensity score uh, weighting, uh, we were able to find that uh, uh, thrombectomy uh, was uh, associated with better outcomes in everybody, um, including uh, those with premorbid disability. So we didn't see what we call an interaction of, of treatment effect based on whether somebody had premorbid disability or not. Um, so that was quite uh, interesting to us as well. This study does shed some light on that uh, because, as I said earlier, you know the the uh, patients with uh, pre-stroke disability that we analyzed in this registry, they got into this registry because they were already being considered by their physicians for some sort of acute stroke therapy. That's the only way you get into these kind of stroke treatment registries. Uh, so it's it's worth noting that even among those patients who are being considered for, say, intravenous thrombolysis, uh, there, there's, there's far fewer of those with pre-morbid disability that end up sort of making the cut, if you will, uh, to go on to uh, uh, thrombectomy. Um, so... It's it's hard to say exactly how this generalizes to kind of the overall stroke population, but you'd imagine that the magnitude of exclusion is probably larger, right? Because because here we already had a pre-selected population that people were interested in treating in some way, shape, or form.